Okay, if you recall, we were looking into the special role that the military bureaucracy was playing within the public bureaucracy. As you would recall in the first couple of weeks of our instruction, we had already indicated that even at the time of the Ottoman Empire, the military institution was wholly autonomous from the civilian and the religious institutions of the system. And when the Republic was established, the military carried a certain weight simply because it provided all the educated personnel of the new state. For all science instruction and education had been taking place within the confines of the military educational institutions of engineering, architecture, medicine, and what have you. And at the same time, military played a very critical role in establishing the Republic. And one of its brightest members, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, was the hero of the War of Liberation. And therefore, the military had enjoyed a special status <coughs> also due to the War of Liberation. Now, however, the military itself was not kept as a major institutional characteristic of the state that is differentiated from the rest of the agencies of the state in the early era of the Republic, for it was the first president and the leader of the Republican People's Party, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk himself, who believed that the military, if it became part of the power play of politics, would be a degenerative force. For he had witnessed how partisan politics, that is, commanders of the military taking part in the politics of the day and choosing different partisan positions and partisan affiliations <coughs> develop a tendency to fight among themselves which then became very dysfunctional in the First Balkan War of 1912. Not only Atatürk himself, but his contemporaries also believed that it was because of this partisan split among the ranks of the Turkish military or the Ottoman military of the time that the Ottoman army was not able to defeat much less powerful Balkan armies when it was locked in war in 1912. The <clears throat> unity and solidarity and harmony of the military institution collapsed because of partisan affiliations of the soldiers who hated each other more than they seemed to have been concerned about the enemy. So they were fighting each other rather than pooling their resources and fighting the enemy in the Balkan War. So he did not want this to repeat. Secondly, he believed that eventually if military commanders were left in a position to get involved in policy making with their troops and arms supporting their positions, they would eventually become new forces in the early Republican era who would be challenging the authority of the Republican People's Party, its leader Atatürk and others. And it would become a very difficult problem for the government to manage the affairs, political affairs and the legislative affairs of the new republic under the circumstances. So, he was instrumental in initiating a golden rule that if the leaders of the military personnel, the top-ranking generals, other officers, 
were, became politically ambitious and they wanted to play some role in the politics of the country, then they must resign their position in the military, participate in the party politics, get elected and serve in the Grand National Assembly. So no political involvement of the military would be tolerated after the establishment of the Republic. Now that position was held until 1960. In 1960, the top brass of the military did not participate in the young officers coup except a few minor exceptions and they held their position within that golden rule of not being involved in politics. But that did not stop a coup from taking place because coups do not only occur in the format of an institutional or a corporate coup of the military where rank and file follow the leadership of the military with its hierarchy intact and the leadership structure respected by the military corps. That is only one type of coup. It's not the only form of coup. As you may have noticed, for example, in the re most recent coup that took place in Burkina Faso, some of you following the international news might have noticed that first, the commander of the troops argued that he was in charge. Then a lower rank colonel argued that he was in charge and he simply dislodged this chief of staff of the Burkina Faso military. So you can have coup within a coup at the same time. There is no structure of coups of that nature and they don't need to follow any set rules for that purpose. Whoever gets more support from the officer corps and the troops of the military gets to rule the military under those circumstances, not the official rank order, not the official hierarchy matters under those circumstances. So the Young Officers Coup of 1960 was an incident in which the top brass of the military was unable to stop the young officers from taking the reins of government in 1960. And they were also removed from power and they were also charged with acting with the Democrat Party government in violation of the Constitution and were involved in treasonous acts and found, some of them were found guilty of wrongdoing in the martial laws and, and, and the special courts established by the military after the 1960 coup. Now, this process of young officers organizing into juntas or a period of young officer juntas <clears throat> continued within the ranks of the military and military tried to re-establish hierarchy within the institution <clears throat> and therefore reimpose institutional professionalism from 1960 onwards and many disciplinary actions were initiated by the new top level commanders for example, when General Jamal Tural <clears throat> became the chief of staff, he started to use some not so ordinary measures to discipline soldiers and officers. If you look at the newspapers of the 1960s, you will see that he was involved in, for example, dropping in 
on troops in the middle of the night, which is very unusual for a chief of staff to go around the country alone and simply check upon the troop preparedness of the, especially the land forces. So he would get into a small Willis jeep, jeep and leave from Ankara in an afternoon and go to Sivas, Kayseri or Bulu and suddenly appear in the middle of the night wreaking havoc among, of course, the troops and the commanders of those troops by such a control by the highest ranked general in the, in the army. This was to make them prepared and focus on their own, own job of serving the military and keep up the morale and at the same time readiness of the troops. Therefore, hold the military back into the barracks and back into its institutional practices and focus them on their own job rather than on politics of the country from then on. That didn't stop the young officers from attempting two more coups in 1962 and 63 under the leadership of a colonel in 1962 and a retired colonel in the same person. in 1963. Colonel Talatay Demir, who was apparently one of the junta members in 1960, but was serving in South Korea as part of the Turkish troops in South Korea under UN command, had not taken part in the 1960 coup, and he believed that things had gone wrong. They had returned the power back to the civilians too early under conditions he didn't fully approve of. So he tried to put the coup in the right track by making another coup in 1962 against the government, this time led by the Republican People's Party under Ismet Inunu's leadership. And therefore, we cannot argue that the young officers were only against the Democrats. They were only motivated by a secularist agenda. That they were only serving the Republican People's Party. These arguments cannot fly in the face of the occurrences of attempted coups in 1962 and 63, all the way to 1971. Whoever was in government, they tried to topple and try to rule. It was the civilian politicians and the top ranks generals who they considered as in acting in conformity with them, some kind of collusion with them. And they were anti-establishment coups. And late 1960s, these officers, the young officers, seemed to have developed a flair for socialism as well. Probably in the early 60s, they were more fascistic in their orientation, highly ethnic nationalistic, perhaps even reaching a level of chauvinistic in their attitude. But by 19, late 1960s, early 70s, they seemed to show a flair of socialism, more or less like the armies in the south of Turkey, in Syria, in Iraq, in, in Egypt, where the socialist officers came to power to dismantle the corrupt monarchies that had been established as stooges of the British and later on the American governments and take the reins of power into their hands and deliver real independence from the West and had become closer in their policies towards the Soviet Union in this bipolar world. Of course, a NATO member country, this was more problematic if something of the sort had happened. So there was, by 9th of March, a purge, not only of young officers, but all those young officers suspected to have socialistic inclinations and 
some kind of credentials that pointed in that direction. So there was a purge. And three days after the purge, there was a memorandum which asked for orderly conduct of business and <clears throat> that initiated sort of a quasi-coup or a half coup which also opened up a way for amending the constitution more along the lines suggested by the right-wing politicians, especially Suleyman Demirel and the Justice Party at the time. So the realm of liberties were to a certain extent trimmed, so the country became less liberal in its orientation, less tolerant of political participation and civic activism after those amendments. Terror was now considered to be a major problem of the country and how it was to be dealt with was debated um, even before the coup but state courts in charge of terror cases were initiated following the French model for state security courts, more or less inspired by it or to an even certain extent copied from the French experience. However, all these importations are of course embedded in the Turkish peculiar political culture and function as such. And when the original inspiration is gone, for example, the French got rid of these security courts, Turkey continued on keeping them until early 2000s. And they were only dismantled after a decision by the European Court of Human Rights, initiated a new process when they were abolished, but still new courts were established in their place called special courts, which in the practice looked as if it was just a simple change of the placard. So the state security court placard was taken down and a new one was put on the building, special court. It seemed to have functioned along the same lines, more or less and did not necessarily operate under normal circumstances of rule of law. So these practices became possible by 1971, only to be further bolstered, enhanced, and became more comprehensive after the 1982 constitution, which was followed by the 1980 coup. Now that constitution provided for a new less liberal or illiberal democratic practice where the president of the country was put in a very important position of control with vested powers of tutelage over the system, functioning as an overlooker of the system, keeping vigil on, the how, on how the system operated without any legal or political responsibility or accountability. Sort of a Greek god, you know, sitting on Chankaya, the Turkish Olympus. It's 800 and some meters from the sea level. Uh, the politicians consider that to be 924 meters, although it isn't so that it, it had been argued by the politicians for a long time that it sits on a 924 meter height hill. 924 rakımlı tepe, as Süleyman Demirel used to refer to it in Turkish. It is not, it's more than 800 meters, but anyhow, that's not the important part. The important part is that it, it used to sit on, on top of a hill and would preside over the system as if Zeus presided over the entire universe once upon a time. And the analogy seems to be very close in the sense that this overwhelmingly powerful institution wielded by one person could interfere on, into almost anything but would not be held accountable for whatever results occur from this intervention. So that was that put the executive in a supreme position by that kind of formulation, although 
de jure, legally, the legislature was argued to be supreme in the Constitution. But this also provided the military another opportunity of sort of rearranging the major forces of the system, not only the constitutional institutions, legislature, executive, judiciary, but also major political forces of the country, co-opted some of them and dislodged others by various acts of the military government, they dislodged those who had even the slightest left-leaning credentials. So it was a big chop on the left. They tried to suppress the left as much as they could. They were purged from the public bureaucracy by various acts. Famous act Fourteen o two led to purges of tens of thousands of teachers, academics, and public bureaucrats from central and local government. And the main criteria seem to be, however defined, being on the left. And in their place, they assigned new personnel. And they argued, officially and unofficially, that these were people who had respect for the state, upholding the state. They had an idea of the state. Being Turkish nationalists seemed to emerge as a credential. And at the same time, those who have had some Islamist connections were considered to be inoculated against leftism. For socialism was atheistic in, in a sense. So the theists, those who believed in Sunni Islam especially, could never become socialist and be therefore corrupted by socialistic ideas. They became dependable personnel who could be used in the governmental bureaucracy in the police as well. So under these circumstances, the new triangle of power, as I mentioned to you last time, the military, the Islamist movement, and the Turkish movement, was established as the Turkish Islamic Synthesis. <clears throat> A new ideology was suggested by the hearth of intellectuals, Aydın Naroja, under that title, marrying the concepts of Turkism Turkish nationalism, ethnic Turkish nationalism, with Islam. And the main leaders of this organization started to pay more attention to Islam. In the early 60s, when the Turkish movement was coming up and getting strong, especially its leader, an ex-colonel, Alpaslan Turkesh, was a highly secular figure and had been propagating secularism. But he switched increasingly to use Islamic terminology as well. For secularism did not seem to help this party to win many votes. They got stuck about 3% of the vote or less in popular politics. And the only way that they, they could have some inroads into the public support seemed to be by using Islam or exploiting Islam to a certain extent. And this terminology became a new terminology to sort of distance it from the earlier terminology of Milliyetçi Mukaddesatçı İttifakı. That is, the nationalist and the believer, we could say, meaning 
Muslim, Sunni Muslim coalition of the past. So it was a new idea in, in a similar garb. And these people who had been closely related with this establishment, the ideas generated by Aydin Laraja, now became entrusted with most critical positions, say, as presidents of public universities or um, running talk shows in Turkish radio and television, which was the only network under the circumstance until 1993, which was legal in Turkey. Therefore, being uh, in charge of programming of the TRT meant manipulating the agenda, thought, and mental waves of the people. So this was a very, very important propaganda ideological tool, which became incorporated into the military government's operations. And new institutions were established as the institutes of Atatürk's principles and Turkish revolution. All of them were basically established or run by people who shared these ideas. Their directors came from this major source and they proselytized these ideas systematically. And of course, no Atatürkists would have done what the military had done at the, at the time they dug the grave of Enver Pasha, who was one of the greatest enemies of Atatürk, in the eyes of Atatürk himself. Dug him out in Dushanbe, Tajikistan, and brought his remains to Istanbul and buried him in the environs of, right next to the graves of his of the other two members of the triumvirate who ran the Ottoman Empire between 1913 and 1918 in Hürriyet Tepesi, or Şişli, Istanbul. If you visit Hürriyet Tepesi, you will see a monument of freedom. It's also called Hürriyet Monument, Monument of Freedom. Abidei Hurriyet, the monument of freedom. There the graves of these three triumvirate are, and his remains were brought in and buried with a huge state ceremony in Istanbul, where the leader of the coup himself, <coughs> Kenan Ebran, led the procession to the burial ground. Symbolically, this is a big affront to whatever Mustafa Kemal and Kemalism stood for under these circumstances. So, my understanding of these developments is that as of 1982, whatever existed of Kemalism was buried with Enver in Istanbul. All this argument about Kemalism of the military, etc., after 1982 is a fiction fantasy, ideological confusion, smokescreen, nothing else. The very military itself did away with Kemalism in one way or another. However, they tried to resuscitate it around 1997, and it failed dismally. For it wasn't very real. Not too many people believed in it. Much had happened between 1980 and 1997, which undermined the credentials of the military as belonging to the same Weltanschauung of Kemalism at the time, that same ideological perspective of the earlier times under these circumstances. But as I had told you, from 1984 onwards, this coalition came under an enormous duress and stress with the emergence of Kurdish nationalists, 
challenge to the solidarity or unity of Turkey. Parti Karkaran Kurdistan was established in 1970s. There are two dates referred to it. 1978 seems to be more plausible, but some also refer to it as 1977. Of all places in Ankara. And started to fight the Turkish military establishment with another dozens of organizations of the same ilk, for originally it was a Maoist organization, which tried to establish some kind of emancipated rural areas for the Kurdish nationalists, and by getting rural support, and then encircle the cities and take over the reins of power in Turkey. And they were preaching some kind of Maoist argument in the very beginning. However, with the military coup, they found the circumstances too difficult for their survival. They took refuge under the Syrian regime in the Beka Valley of Lebanon, stayed there for a long time. Then made a comeback in 1984 from Syria. So the relations between the Kurdish community of Syria and Turkey, which is flaring up in today's Turkish press, Kobani, etc., etc., there have been many Syrians fighting against Turkey in the ranks of PKK for a very, very long time. And the members of the state and the government did not make much argument about this so far. Only one sentence has so far been uttered by Mr. Arunch, the spokesperson for the cabinet, in his press conference. He said, we do not say this is fitting for you. Oh, olsun demiyoruz in Turkish. Referring to the, the baggage of the past, where so many Syrian Kurds were fighting in the ranks of PKK against Turkey, supported by the Syrian state, which had been trying to create huge problems for Turkey in the 80s and 90s and originally by the support of the Soviet Union, which was, of course, harassing a NATO member country. And it made a lot of reasonable explanation as to why PKK would become such a Syrian Soviet force challenging the Turkish system as such. Now, the situation changed rapidly after 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed. Suddenly, the Turkish-Iraqi border became a completely different political geography by the invasion of Iraq by the American forces in 1990, 1991, in the first Gulf War. When there was a big attempt by the Saddam's army to crush the Kurds, who he considered as the fifth column of the Americans, acting in coalition with the Americans to undermine his regime, he moved against them and also in the south against the Shiites. Crushed them both. Shiites paid a heavier price. Kurds start to take refuge in Turkey and also in Iran in large numbers. Almost overnight, about half a million Kurds passed the Turkish border and took refuge in Turkey. And it had created a big impact on the resources of the Turkish government at the time. But 
at the beginning of the war, the then government, Motherland Party government, had calculated, and so did the president who had been the leader and the founder of the Motherland Party in 1983, had become the president after 1989, Turgut Özal, and the Motherland Party government, but it was the president and the former leader of the Motherland Party who made it vocal, argued that Turkey will invest one and will receive 20 in return. Then it was scaled down to about five to three. Eventually, Turkey invested one and then gave another three because of the embargo it imp imposed on the Turkish-Iraqi border. For the Turkish-Iraqi border had become one of the most important trade routes between Turkey and one of its most important trading partners, Iraq. In the 1980s, Iraq became the second most important trading partner of Turkey to Germany. Which was number one. Now, what Turkey did was to impose an embargo in this region which will stop all traffic between Turkey and Iraq before any Arab country imposed an embargo on Iraq. <clears throat> the entire calculation was an economic calculation. There had been some arguments in the past that Saddam had threatened Turkey. In fact, after 1989, when the Berlin Wall collapsed and the world started to change, before the demise of the Soviet Union, which collapsed on the 31st of December 1991, in that interim period, Turkish Prime Minister, Mr. Yildirim Akbut, visited Baghdad and talked to Saddam. Allegedly, he was told, or that is what he told us, that is, those of us who lived in Turkey then, that Saddam told him, now that the world has changed, bipolar world is gone, NATO is less of a fighting force and is on demise. How are you going to defend yourself against us? He was boasting with the 750,000 army and possession of weapons of mass destruction at his disposal at the time. So the Turkish president brought this issue up with President Bush, not the son, the father, in 1989, that Saddam is a menace and we have to take special measures for him. One year before Saddam Hussein decided to attack Kuwait and annex it and argued in this conversation that he could do such things, attack the neighbors. He didn't calculate Kuwait. He was talking of Turkey, attack neighbors and try to grab land from the neighbors. And when Saddam Hussein attacked Kuwait, President Bush suddenly remembered this conversation between Özal and himself and argued that Turks knew about the developments and they have to be taken seriously in these, in these arguments and had to be brought into some kind of a coalition. And it was this kind of interpretation by Bush which precipitated Mr. Azal to think that if Turkey played along with the U.S., a lot of benefit would accrue for Turkey, which turned out to be wrong. In fact, the cost was huge for Turkey for imposing this embargo. Now, when the embargo was imposed, Turkey was growing, again, relatively robustly at the time, in 1989. 88, 89, 
even up to that time in 1990. Between 1980 and 1988, Iraq and Iran were at war. They're still at war. There's an armistice treaty. No peace treaty was signed between the two. So the, they are still at a state of war, the two countries. But there's an armistice line in between them now. So Turkey became one major route of all goods and commodities going to both of those countries, but especially Iraq, throughout that war. And the two continued to build up their weapon systems after the Armistice Treaty was signed in 1988. The arms race continued. To hold these material from the rest of the world into Iraq and Iran, Turkey built a huge fleet of trucks. It became the largest fleet of trucks in Europe by 1988. Most of these trucks were owned by people from the east of the country, and the truck business boomed. So did all those catering to the truckers, gas depots, repair shops, truck salesmen, or automotive supplies, restaurants, hotels, roads. There was a huge boom, as I've already told you this before, which was followed by a very su sudden stop, a big bust. As a result of which, the people of the East blamed the downturn of the East on the policies of the Turkish government, which they thought was a measure taken against them in particular. Whereas the rest of the country continued on growing rapidly, east and southeastern part of the country stopped. So they saw this disparity again enlarging very rapidly. They started to give support to PKK in enormous numbers. And the PKK problem became a much more pressing and much more important problem as of 1990. At the same time, because of the move of Saddam to the, to the north, trying to crush the Kurdish troops, which precipitated a gush of population into Turkey for refuge, Turkey asked the United Nations and also major powers of the world to establish a safe zone above the 37th parallel so that this would become a no-fly zone and no Iraqi troop movements above this zone would be permitted. It was negotiated and agreed upon between Turkey, Britain, France, and the United States. And this no-fly zone started to be practiced, and that pushed the Saddam's forces to the south of the 37th parallel, create a safe haven for, for Kurds. But in this mayhem, they left behind quite a bit of weapons in the north, and they started to support PKK against Turkey as well. And the PKK's firepower increased tremendously. Not only were they able to find more warriors to participate in their ranks to fight against Turkey, but they had more and most, more effective weapons at their disposal. So quite an accident. And Turkey started to play, uh, pay a very heavy toll in deaths because of that. So from about 1,500 deaths, deaths climbed until 1999, when the leader of the PKK was captured in Kenya by the US forces and turned over to Turkey, about 30,000 people died. So 20 times as many died between 1990 and 1999 
in comparison to 1984 to 1990. What needed to be done? One solution suggested by the military and the Turkish movement was to convert these people into Turks, make them believe in being Turkish on the one hand, therefore use a lot of propaganda, media, press, etc. And at the same time, inhibit them from propagating against Turkey and use the military to effectively crush the security challenge this wave of terror was presenting Turkey. As opposed to this, the Islamist movement argued that this was not the way to go. Instead, we have to get rid of all other baggage we had up until then and unite the, the Kurds and the Turks under some form of Sunni Islam. Majority of Kurds happen to be Shafis. They belong to the Sunni sect of Islam. The majority of Turks are Hanafis. They are also Sunnis. So therefore unite them in religion. And religion should become the basis of unity. And of course, get rid of secularism in, in essence, if not in form, in spirit, completely. It wasn't working. So then came back this argument all over again for Kemalism, secularism, breach of secularism, etc. This fight in the National Security Council meeting of 28th of February 1997 which the military tried to keep the coalition intact, keep the Islamist movement in place, keep itself in the driver's seat, and keep the status quo established by the 1982 constitution in operation. Unscathed, unscathed, unchanged, if possible. Their attempt failed dismally after 2002. And now, this triangle has completely changed. Now it's perhaps not even a triangle. We have the Islamist movement here. Dislodging the military. And therefore moving up. In their place is the Kurdish or Kurdist movement. in some kind of uneasy relationship with the Turkish movement. But the Islamist movement now plays one against the other effectively. And depending on its calculations, follows different strategies of cajoling, co-opting them from time to time, and uh, pushing the others off from time to time. And the military is now relegated to a very low position of becoming any agency of the state under these circumstances. And that is the transition from 1997 up until 2007, the 10 year period. Okay, as we mentioned yesterday, there had been a big row over the place and position of the Islamist political parties in Turkish politics in 1990s, which culminated in a row over the meeting of the National Security Council under the leadership of the prime pre president of the time, Mr. Suleyman Demiral in 1997, on the 28th of February. And in this meeting, there was scathing criticism of the government, which was a coalition government in which the leading partner was the Political Islamist Welfare Party for their policies based upon s 
a set of values which the military assumed contradicted the secular principles of the Constitution and of the Republic. And they insisted that a decision which had been taken approximately 24 years ago in a meeting of the National Education Ministry on eight years of mandatory education, extended mandatory education in Turkey from five to eight years, emerged as the central focal point of the debate, which was assumed to be a major stifling influence or blow on religious instruction, for it had been assumed that the guttural sounds necessary in the reading of the Holy Quran could only be learned in relatively naive ages and not after the development of the larynx beyond the age of 12 or 13. So there was a big debate whether it would be possible for these students to be able to learn to recite the Quran in either their readings or from memory. And that created a lot of debate in the Grand National Assembly. And when this legislation was moved on by the coalition government that came into power after the Welfare Party pulled out of the coalition on the 18th of June, 1997. <clears throat> and for the first time in a committee meeting, we observed a big confrontation between the opposition member parties and especially the Welfare Party deputies and the government party deputies or deputies from the government coalition. And fistfights broke out for the first time in a committee meeting. This pattern recurs and continued all the way until yesterday. Those of you who watched the news yesterday might have noticed that in the meeting of the Budgetary Commission on the budget of the Ministry of the Interior Affairs saw a lot of insults hurled back and forth between um, the opposition and the government and also among the opposition parties, various of them, uh, over the terminology used and the questions asked. Now, whether the 28th of February 1997 constituted a a military coup or an attempted coup or not has been debated ever since, but it does not conform to the technical definition of the coup that we use in the literature. Coup, as you know, refers to the movement of the arm suddenly to hit something. This is a coup. It's doing this. So if you suddenly push the government out of power, that would be coup. However, it was argued that this was an attempted coup. Well, if it were an attempted coup, then a coup did not materialize, or it was enormously slow motion, for it took several months until the government collapsed. So it was not a sudden movement of the arm, but a very slow movement of the arm, if that were the case, in the case of a coup. There was definitely some questioning and some debate back and forth between the government and the representative of the military in these debates, because we know what the debates was like after they are published in the press during the court hearings on this issue in 2013. 
And that's the only time that we have been able to learn about these meetings. And it doesn't look as if there is any threat or any attempt to push the government out of power. But there is a lot of criticism about the way government is handling some policies. And um, there is also a lot of effort on the part of the president of the country to keep the debate within bounds and try to find a position of compromise which the government could undersign. Eventually, a proposal emerged from that meeting and it was signed by the government, which obviously assumes that the government accepted some of these criticisms or played along with them for whatever reason, but did not resist them. Had the government decided to, to resign as of that moment, or had the government refused to, to sign this document the president had negotiated, then the grounds for arguing that there was a coup or something like a coup attempt would have made much more sense. But short of that, it is not very likely that there was a coup, but there was a lot of questioning. So you may consider that as a pressure. A military often acts as a pressure group, so I consider this as an act of pressure group rather than anything else. And there was this effort, perhaps, to reestablish the coalition, the triangle that I drew up yesterday, where the military would be the most critical decision maker on the essential functions of the state, security, defense, foreign policy, and that the political Islamist movements were expected to play the role of legitimizer of government decision making, no more than that, and not play a major role. This attempt failed eventually in 2002 with the <coughs> advent of events or unfolding of electoral behavior and the Justice and Development Party which emerged out of the ranks of the political Islamist virtue party but then argued that it is not a simple continuation of that political party severs all its ties with the National Outlook Movement Milli Gürüş Hareketi and that rejects and negates the past it's a new movement, it's a conservative movement, and it believes in democracy. And that is a new beginning for this political party, and seemed to have been welcomed by the critical pluralities of the voters who have been supporting this political party ever since. However, during the election of the president in the Grand National Assembly in 2007, another scuttle ha happened or another major confrontation climaxed between the military who had argued that they were expecting someone who respected the secular order of the constitution to be their commander in chief. And on the evening of the 27th of April in 2007, the media reported that on the web page of the chief of staff of the military, appeared an email message arguing that they, the military will not accept a quote-unquote Islamist or political Islamist president. And the insinuation was President Abdullah Gül and therefore would consider taking some measures eventually. And this sounded as if there was some kind of a threat and as an attempted coup by email. However, the events that took place afterwards were both mind-boggling and very interesting. First of all, the chief of staff of the military, Yashar Buchanan, general, and the prime minister Erdogan met in the Prime Minister's office in Istanbul at Dolmabahce Palace, had a secret meeting, the minutes of which 
have still not unearthed and may probably emerge from the memoirs of either in the longer run, perhaps. Soon after that, there were several questions by the opposition parties in the Grand National Assembly, by the media, by the press. None were answered by either party. Whatever happened stayed with them. But neither the military continued their argument, and they fell silent from that point onwards, nor was any charges pressed against Yashar Buchanan or any prosecution on the matter that this constituted some form of attempted coup. So, what happened? By acting in such a way and then stepping back, Yashar Buyukanat seemed to have given the impression that the government is highly powerful and that the military respected it. That they were wrong in their declaration. And the government seemed to have come out of this confrontation with enormous amount of power and they were able to project a very prestigious position. Besides, in the eyes of the voters, the military has never been very prominent or popular. In fact, in 1983, when Turgut Ezal ran against the choice of the military in the 1983 elections, as the leader of the Motherland Party, his Motherland Party won 45% of the vote and emerged as the front runner and emerged out, out of that race as the choice of the people and ruled the country for the next four years. Therefore, military's outspokenness usually helps the right-wing political parties who the military criticizes. So, there have been a lot of arguments that this was nothing more than a conspiracy that provided the Justice and Development Party with additional prestige in the eyes of the people, pushed larger swaths of the population to support the, that political party against the military during the elections. And in fact, as opposed to Motherland Party's 45%, Justice and Development Party was able to obtain 46% of the vote in the 2007 elections. Very close percentages, as you can see, out of this confrontation. And furthermore, Yashar Buchanan had a very honorable retirement and was given a a car which is shielded against bombs and is valued at about $1 million by the Prime Minister. A gift in return for what? Asked the press at the time and also the opposition. When you put all of this together, it doesn't look as if the 27th of April 2007 looks like a coup. And then Prime Minister Erdogan declared on several occasions that this is not a coup. It was not a coup. So, what was it? Conspiracy of the two to enhance the chances of the Justice and Development Party to garner more votes? We don't know. We will eventually get more about it when we have more tangible evidence. We don't have any evidence. However, the only party that benefited from this confrontation was Justice and Development Party. And that's only the only thing that we can go on with. So, until now, <coughs> the official interpretation of this by the public prosecutor's offices, by the Prime Minister, by the spokespersons of the Justice and Development Party, is that it's, it was not a coup, it was not an attempted coup, it had nothing to do with that.
So as political scientists, all we can do is to agree with them that this was not a coup. However, in the, in the media and uh, in the popular magazines, journals, daily newspapers, editorials continue to refer to it as a coup still. We may also consider this as a divided opinion. But as far as I can tell, there is not enough evidence pointing to it. When the main culprits, both of the main culprits, refuse it. And Yashar Buchanan eventually was interviewed on the NTV television network, in which he said that nobody knew about this email. He was personally responsible for putting it up there. He personally wrote it. It was his opinion. And therefore, it did not somehow commit the military to this opinion. Yet another position on this. However, from 2007 onwards, there have been many investigations into the 20th of February 1997. No investigation into, into this, 27 April 2007, but 10 years earlier, 28 February 1997, 12th of September 1980 coup, other coups, coup attempts, and this and that. Uh, nothing before that, actually. Main culprits of the coups that took place before this year passed away. Only the two commanders who were still alive last year were put on trial. Um, both of them are close to the age of 100 and they're not in good health conditions. Um, and they were not the sole responsible individuals for the making of the coup and what happened afterwards. The irony of this investigation of the 12th of September 1980 coup is that that coup literally crushed the left in Turkey. And the left is not part of the scene of this investigation or of the charges being made. It is being made by the current government, which benefited tremendously from the 12th of September 1980 coup. It was this coup that enabled the political Islamists to be employed en masse against the socialist or communist threat at the time. They had their inroads into the police force and into public bureaucracy in large numbers. Also. The MHP, as well as the left, were considered as the main partners in the havoc that Turkey faced in the 1970s. So there was some clampdown on the Grey Wolves, the younger members of the National Action Party as well. So they had not been that successful in infiltrating the state to the extent that the Islamists were although some of them had been employed by coalition governments earlier and they kept their positions and the, their purges were relatively less in number. Big number of those who were considered to be leftists, we don't know whether they were leftists or not, but considered to be leftists were purged. Many of them were charged, many were imprisoned, many were tortured. Those who were implicated with Kurdish nationalism were also not only imprisoned, but also tortured in prison. Many accounts of that have unearthed so far. Those who were responsible for these kinds of atrocious acts were not put on trial. Only these two very old, debilitated commanders were put in charge, put, in, put on trial, and they were charged and found guilty. And the legal basis of this kind of a court case is also found to be dubious by respectful lawyers in Turkey as well. So we're not in a position that Turkey has done much to improve uh, the standards of rule of law so far as this performance was concerned. Now, so far as the 28th of February 1997 
Meaning is concerned that that trial is continuing. You can listen to it um, and follow the decisions and reportings about it in the press. Um, we'll see what kind of a outcome will arise from it. However, one side of the debate is in power now, and it, it seems to have a lot of say in the way the judiciary acts. Therefore, it doesn't look as if it's a very legitimate way of putting these people on trial, or at the same time, whether the trial is actually operating within the standards suggested by the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe or by uh, the Convention of Human Rights that is enforced by the European Court of Human Rights. We will see all of that eventually in the future. Um, then emerged another series of cases that there had been attempts from 2003 onwards of conspiring to topple the government by means of a military coup. A famous one was this big conspiracy known as the Erganacon affair. That there is a deep state organization which takes its name from the myth of Turkish nationalists, the myth that, that the Turkish nationalists believed played a role in the emergence of Turks as a race in the world. And this myth is about a legendary wolf which took them out of a certain valley in the Altau Mountains into the plains of Central Asia and eventually they were able to develop into a civilization of their own. And, then, and since these people were highly, highly nationalist, they adopted this name for themselves. And it is sort of the example of a clandestine state operation, more like Gladio in Italy. Arganacon is sort of the same kind of or similar kind of organization in the Turkish case, which had been established by NATO in the Italian case and had been involved in summary executions of the Red Brigades and what have you. Nothing came out of it in the Italian investigations of this organization and there was some kind of a silencing of it or covering it up. In the Turkish case, these people were put on trial because it was assumed that they were eventually going to assassinate and topple the government or do both. These hearings started in 2008 and continued all through. The evidence fielded did not again live up to the international standards of legal principles. There were too many violations of the standards of law. Some witnesses were considered as secret witnesses, never known. They revealed their information. Only one of them turned out to be a major PKK commander eventually. The rest of them were left unknown. Some of the evidence, when it was interrogated by the defense lawyers, seemed to have had dubious grounds of existence. Some basic principles of defense were overlooked. Then there was a second case, a seminar conducted in the First Army in Istanbul known as the Sledgehammer Operation or Balios Harekate, was actually a planning for a coup. If it were, it was the first time anything of the sort happened. Because in the previous three coups that we had, nobody had any inkling that this was going on, except perhaps for the State Secret Service. And when they unearthed some evidence, the government did not, had not believed in them at the time, in 1960. And nobody 
A lot of people suspected that the military would move in in 1980, but nobody knew how, when, etc. The planning was very well carried out, in secret. And as far as we know, there were no major documents of this. Now, this is a huge seminar. And the seminar included outrageous claims of, of various sorts, bombing of mosques, bombing of uh, Greek planes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, this this case also seemed to have had several loopholes in it. The basic damning evidence about it was surfaced in a, on a CD. However, the CD had fonts that only appeared in the market in 2008. And it was argued that this, this CD was composed in 2003. Furthermore, on the CD, there were information about the appointment of certain people to certain positions in the military, which also materialized in 2008 and 2009. And it was argued that this was discussed in this 2003 seminar five or six years before the appointment of a person who at the time was a captain. And it looked as if on the seminar notes that this person was to be assigned the job of a colonel. Now that, that didn't make much sense. How had they known in this period of time? So the opposition brought up all these issues and argued that these, this CD was fake. As the debate was continuing, a second CD was unearthed in some other place in the Navy. This time there was some fresh argument. And the court decided that not only these people, but also the secretaries, for example, typing the notes of these seminars and keeping the minutes were also guilty of the conspiracy. One secretary got 16 years of imprisonment because of typing the notes. And she was in no position to say, well, I'm not going to be sitting here and typing your notes during the seminar. No such thing would have been possible in the military. So the argument went that you know, there were things not fitting the picture very well. Some argue that they were not even in Turkey during the events. One of these people argued that he was on a Turkish ship in the Indian Ocean, surveying and protecting the shipping routes against the Somalian pirates during the time. Not only the court, but the higher appeals court also argued that the nature of things are such that no person need to be in this meeting in person, that this person can actually take part through electronic messaging. Was there any evidence of it? No. So how are we going to know whether this such an electronic messaging took place? Nobody knew. But this didn't stop either the special court or the appeals, high appeals court, or Supreme Court of Appeals, the Argatai, from passing these judgments. All of this went all the way until the 17th of December, 2003. On that day, very serious evidence was unearthed that implicated that the prime minister and several ministers of the government had been involved in deep corruption. Suddenly, the entire set of events had a complete U-turn. The ministers resigned, the prime minister continued, and this time turned around and argued that there were two conspiracies, one against the military, one against him, by a parallel structure of the state that is now established by foreign conspiracy of the Americans and the Israelis. And at the same time, it is connected to a certain mullah who resides in Pennsylvania and who is the main culprit.
And these people, instead of following the directions of the government, followed the directions of this mullah and actually created this conspiracy against the military and put them in prison. So the government moved against the decision of the High Appeals Court as well, released these people and opened the way for retrial. Now that motion is continuing. When you look at this picture in total, this doesn't bode well with rule of law at all. Turkish judiciary flunked in this case completely. The entire handling of this matter did not result in bolstering rule of law or democracy, but tarnishing it, very unfortunately. There have been many admonishments of this. Don't do this this way. Pay attention to legal procedures, standards, etc. But nobody heeded them. And now, the quote unquote, this parallel structure is on the run. And the government is in pursuit. They're trying to identify these people and put them on trial. Will we be seeing the same thing all over again? We'll see. If they haven't learned from the mistakes that they had conducted and move without tangible evidence, but flimsy arguments with shady characters emerging as witnesses, with no clear-cut evidence indicating that anything of the sort had happened, orders from Pennsylvania coming instead of the orders of the prime minister or others, that Prime Minister had not ordered the arrest of the members of a Kurdish organization known as KCK, or ordered the arrest of these soldiers. No investigation of the sort took place in the Ministry of the Interior, and in spite of this fact, all of these happened without the knowledge, support, or tolerance of the government, if that can be proven in the court, I don't know anybody else, I'm, I'm ready to believe in it. But there seems to be no evidence indicated in that direction. So all of this is turning into a witch hunt again. And it doesn't look well for the performance of the rule of law. We have to pull ourselves into the rule of law for that to happen. And judiciary, under these circumstances, is under enormous amount of pressure, which it is not handling quite well as far as we can tell for the time being. I'll get back to the judiciary. But all of this seemed to have created a loss of appetite among the military to try to intervene and put the, the political house of Turkey in order again. It looks as if the chance of a corporate coup now is close to zero if it is not zero. Secondly, it looks as if a group of soldiers who were high on nationalism, ethnic Turkish nationalism, are purged from the military. In their place, a more Atlanticist group of soldiers in closer contact with NATO, and that kind of international perspective seemed to be having the higher hand in the struggle within the ranks of the military, these two factions. And it had been argued, again, without any evidence, that a religious contingency of um, infiltrations have occurred. And now there is a religious faction within the military itself as well. well. If it exists, we will get to see that in the years to come. And we don't know that yet. So that this is left now a military that is much less relevant to Turkish politics than had been the case earlier without any corporate coup capacity left. However, we don't know what the young officers were doing, and we don't know whether we've gone back to the 1959, 1960, so far as Turkey's relations between the civilian authorities and the military are concerned. Now, why did the coups occur? Major causes. First of all, there was a breakdown of democracy, democratic form of government, under protracted economic and or other crises, international, political, whatever.
Before each military coup, there was considerable amount of political instability in the country where people were dying, fighting in the streets. Large numbers of people were being arrested. A military in the streets of the country trying to establish calm, martial law, curfew, etc. And it usually coincided with a period of paralysis in the legislature especially, where governments seem to be paralyzed in the face of evolving events. There were also international approval of the coups. None of the coups created a major reaction from the various international organizations Turkey belonged to. UN, Council of Europe, NATO, none of the others. And of course, there is also good reason to assume that coups were re related to each other as causes and effects, which doesn't explain the coup in 1960, but the coup of 1960 seemed to have precipitated the coup attempt of 1962 and 63. as well as the coup in 1971, which was a corrective intervention by the military through a mem memorandum, which then seemed to have precipitated another corrective corporate coup in 1980, which then seemed to have precipitated another corrective pressure in 1997. So each coup, once it starts, sets into motion a series of steps when they do not reach the ultimate goal of the coup makers, precipitate intervention by the military again to put the house in order. And it gives the impression that the military tried to put the house in order so that a stable democratic environment could set root in Turkey and politicians failed to deliver this result and they continued on tinkering with the system, changing the rules, making new experiments and trials to find a certain arrangement, a design that would work. What they have failed to understand, that there is no such design. It is the making of the Constitution itself, as, as the article that I assigned you to read by Ergen Özbudun, which paves the way for the consolidation of democracy as much as what is agreed upon. There is no set recipe for democracy, which you can simply purchase from somewhere else or import. It's not like getting a car from the international market. It doesn't work that way. You have to build it yourself. It has to stand on its own feet, should set its roots in the domestic soil of the country. There's a certain culture in which it'll work. It's not, let me use a computer terminology, it's not a hardware problem. It's a software problem, or not only a hardware problem. It's also a software problem. And the software is provided by the culture. If you can't get the software right, the hardware doesn't work. So you got the hardware from Westminster Model in 1924. With our culture that promotes authoritarian politicians, who despise opposition and consider them as enemy, Westminster model 
culminated in the war of political parties, not their competition. And the relationship between them broke down. So we need something else. Something we need to find ourselves, invented by our, our own means. We have to sit down and establish the rules of the game. What we're going to accept and morally commit ourselves to it in the longer run. Short of that, it looks as if running the democratic system in Turkey is virtually impossible. That's one big lesson we get out of this exercise. Now the military is out of the picture, the politicians are on their own. Let's see what they can do. Now the system of the executive branch of government at the national level also created for a while many autonomous executive agencies of the state. The part of the central administration for a while until 2011 enjoyed autonomy. Then they became a part of the prime minister's office as of 2011. They were centralized, so to speak. State planning organization is now closed down and is taken as part of the Ministry of Economic Development. If you search for this organization on the web, you find nothing. Its website is closed. It has now become a ministry of its own. It was established in 1961 and survived until the reforms of 2011. It was established to produce five-year plans for Turkey so that Turkish economy could be managed better, so that economic crises could be avoided, so that certain problems of Turkey could be fixed. Unfortunately, neither those plans were able to solve these problems, nor the politi politicians follow those plans. Patronage politics, clientelism, the culture of political interaction between the elites and the people does not bode well with planning. Therefore, they're sidelined. Now this same activity is carried out by a Ministry of Economic Development, a part of the executive branch of the government and the Council of Ministers, no longer an autonomous agency. Turkish Radio and Television has its own law, to a certain extent autonomous, but there is a regulatory body which looks into its operation, and that is run by the government's appointments, mainly. Actually, its members are appointed on the same majoritarian principle that operates in the legislature. Therefore, there is a majority of government appointed personnel who then look into the TRT's operation from the perspective of the government. And therefore, it fails to be a regulatory body that enjoys the respect, support, and the legitimacy in the eyes of all. And Turkish radio and television, therefore, when a strong government is in power, becomes the mouthpiece of the government, more or less, and loses its independence. And this became most easily perceptible during the presidential elections of 2014, where it was discovered in July that in a single day, TRT allocated more than 520 minutes for the speeches of the candidate of the Justice and Development Party, the Prime Minister at the time of Erdogan, as opposed to for about four minutes for the main opponent, Ihsan Olu, and less than a minute, about 45 seconds, for Selahattin Demirtas, who came out in the press and argued that this is a strict violation of 
the election law, which says that TRT should allocate e equal time to all candidates. And it's written in that way. No room for any kind of evaluation, assessment, reinterpretation, or what have you. Very clearly written. Nothing much happened. Central bank is supposed to be an independent agency of the state. From time to time, it loses its independence. And in fact, it was last year this time that the prime minister was arguing that he is the voice of the nation, national will. And he would not take a step back in the case of the central bank following a different policy. We know from economics literature that central banks are assigned with the duty of monitoring consumer price inflation. They're supposed to make sure that inflation is managed properly. Take all the necessary measures required for it. That's their raison d'etre, basic goal in the macroeconomic planning of a country. And the government should take that into consideration while taking their steps. Our government tried to change it around last year. And fortunately, it didn't cause a disaster so far. And tried to perturb into the operation of the central bank and question its independence. The basic argument was that it's the elected body of politicians who should control everything. There's no room for expertise, no room for independent agencies under those circumstances. Although American Federal Reserve or the Central Bank of Britain, France, or Germany could be independent, Turkish Central Bank in a democratic system cannot be independent. It has to be under the diktat of the elected politicians, whether you believe it or not. State economic enterprises had enjoyed some independence, some of them now privatized, some are in the process of being privatized, and the more recently established Banking Regulation and Supervision Agency, BDDK, Savings Deposit and Insurance Fund have been instrumental in dealing with the financial crisis of 2001. They cleared the mess, tidied up the banks, closed some of them down, sold others, and they were very successful in dealing with the financial crisis. They were also centralized, made part of the Prime Minister's office. Higher Educational Council for the time being enjoys some independence, though the recent appointment to it is a person who is tremendously close to the president of the country and it seems as if this relationship will be um, very interesting and intriguing to watch and Higher Educational Council could go back to its original format when it was established in 1981, more or less as a regulatory body that works as a corporative control mechanism of the state within the universities. We will see whether this will develop or not. It's too early to tell whether we're going to go in that, in that direction or not. But there are some signs that we can be considering something of that sort. A new regional planning administration was assigned and originally by the state planning organization in the 21st century for the first time. Regions have been defined in Turkey and these regions had their own development planning and development agencies at work and they have been active for the last three to four years now. But they have now been taken over by the ministry and they have lost their relative independence and are closely connected and monitored by the ministry as such. So a period of immense re-centralization is continuing in the Turkish system since 2011. The events of the 17th of December 2013 increased this 
re-centralization and control from one single center. Very close to the prime minister then, president now. Then below the level of the regions, there are provinces. Each province has a governor's office and a special provincial administration, Ilo Zelidaresi, that is connected to it. However, in 2013, the law changed in 30 of the 81 provinces of Turkey. And in those 30 provinces, greater city municipality has become provincial metropolitan municipality. Therefore, the boundaries of the greater city municipality and the province became the same in Istanbul, in Izmir, in Ankara, but in some humongous provinces such as Konya, for example. Konya is almost as large as Belgium. And the mayor of Konya, the urban center, now is in charge of a village 320 kilometers away in the Taurus Mountains, for example. And that villager votes for the city mayor now of a city that he or she never sets foot and has had no interaction in the past. Now we'll be expecting services to come from that city center to that village. And they became part and parcel of the same province. The smallest of these provinces is Ordu, with about 750,000 population. And of course, these 30 provinces now host somewhere around three-fourths of the entire population of the country. So, since March 2013, this step is taken, and therefore there are now two different types of provincial administrations. One administration by a governor, and this special provincial administration added on to it, which has an elected body of councillors, provincial councillors, who are mainly elected from the rural areas as representatives of rural areas, but by the people of all who live in the provincial areas in these 51 cities. Then in the 30 cities, you have a governor who is in charge of security matters appointed from the center. All governors are appointed from the center. And the city mayors, and most critical among them, the mayor of the greater city, metropolitan city administration, who is directly elected by the people of the entire province. And the city councillors, who are elected at the sub-district, smaller city levels, and from among them, they gain representation in the provincial metropolitan administration's council. And the system has become much more complicated. It looks as if the only motive my colleagues who study public administration could find so far is to enable the peasants in various relatively rural metropolitan areas to vote for the central city mayors, with which it was assumed that these people, being more conservative, would vote for the government candidates, which is known as gerrymandering in the literature, which is a concept of American politics, which is something to do with this mayor, I'm sorry, this uh, governor of Massachusetts by the name of Jerry, who used to create interesting electoral districts to enable his party to win outright an, elect an electoral contest, which are known as safe districts. So the shapes look like salamander. And the people of the United States put these two names together and called this gerrymandering. Jerry creating these salamander-like electoral districts. So this was an example of gerrymandering. By doing so, you can make many of the districts so homogenous that the opposition party 
does not even bother to field a candidate. Most American districts are of this nature, as you may have discovered, if you have read The Economist in the first week of November. If you haven't, read so. You will see that only in a very few districts there was real competition in the United States. Most of them safe seats. That was the attempt. And by doing so, again, my colleagues seem to have believed that it would become possible for Justice and Development Party to win in those electoral districts that it had not been successful in winning the mayor's seat, such as Izmir, Antalya. Well, it happened in Adana, Mersin. It happened in the case of Antalya, but not in the case of Izmir. Antalya um, was won by the Justice and Development Party, but not Izmir. Still, Izmir was able to elect its mayor from the ranks of the Republican People's Party. So this is the provincial picture and the municipal picture of the country, where all mayors are elected, however big the city happens to be. But in 30 cities where you have metropolitan administrations, such as Istanbul, its metropolitan mayor is also elected independently of all other mayors, elected at the district level. And there are many districts to each greater city. Then in each province, there are sub-provincial districts, which we know as Ilche. As the province is called Il, and then sub-district is called Ilche. It has a governor called Kaimakam as written here. It usually hosts a small city or some town, which we, which we call Balde, small town, which also has an elected mayor in some circumstances, if the number of people living there are not too few. Then we have, within the city's quarters, which we call Mahalle, and each mahalle has its own elected muhtar and its elected councillors, ihtiyar heyeti. For the Turkish students, of course, ihtiyar is usually used to mean old, but ihtiyar in this case is another Arabic word that comes from the suffix, uh, that comes from the root of um, hiyar, which means Choice, chosen. So ihtiyar means chosen by the people of the community. So muhtar in an elected body serves with the muhtar. And of course, at the level of the village, we also have a muhtar, a headman or a woman nowadays, who also serves with a elected council alongside it. So you have central administration, regional administration, provincial administration, provincial metropolitan administration, sub-district provincial administration, city administration, town administration, within cities, quarter administrations, and in the rural areas, village administrations. Very highly multi-layered. All of them are elected, except for the public bureaucracy that serves in the autonomous agencies, used to serve in the autonomous agencies, which are no longer autonomous. The agencies still stand, but they are centralized, so to speak, mostly. And also, of course, the bureaucrats of the ministries, who are also career bureaucrats, they are appointed usually after a certain examination and not necessarily elected. But these positions are all elected. So in a regular electoral process, with all candidates, etc., we have more than a million people who run for these offices, and about a similar number of people who would get elected under these circumstances. And 
Every five years, these elections take place on the same day. And Turkey always have national local elections. Local elections carried out nationally in one day. And they seem to be a motion that is um, highly perceptible and highly important in Turkish politics because they give the relative importance of the political parties in the elections, national elections to come. However, the law says that if there is an election, a national election, within a year of the local elections carried out nationally, they're held on the same day. So every five years, we had local elections in 2014. Five years from now, 2019. Um, that means in 2019, we will probably have um, another four years after the national elections of 2015 is 2019. The chances are that on the very same day, we will have the national and the local elections together. And there will be many ballots to fill many boxes. In the local elections, you have something like seven or eight ballot boxes, so you'll have many more. It'll be a mind-boggling experience. And if we can get everything right, we may even have the presidential election on the same day. One big stake. How about that? Whoever wins it, wins the whole pie. And that, of course, increases the stakes up very high, and it's not a good idea for for any democracy to put all your eggs in the same basket or to increase the stakes so high that winner takes all and the losers lose everything. That is usually a recipe for conflict and disaster. So 2019 will have a jackpot. And it's going to be a very, very tense period going up to that era in time. It is organized to adjudicate on matters of different types of law, constitutional law, all kinds of criminal law, administrative law, court of accounts, is also a high court that looks into the accounting practices of the state agencies, all of them, except that of the military, which is covered specially, but the rest of the agencies are audited by, the, by this court and reported, reporting of this auditing results are handed over to the Grand National Assembly and the Supreme Board of Elections, which monitors the elections, supervises the elections, and runs the elections. Once the law is promulgated from the Grand National Assembly, it is put into the hands of the Supreme Board of Election, and Supreme Board of Election implements the law. This has been the practice since 1950. Previously, it was the executive branch of the government, governor's offices at the provinces, that looked into the matter of organizing and running the elections, which came under scaling criticism of the opposition in the 1946 elections, for they were heavily rigged. So from then on, 1950 onwards, it's been the job of the Supreme Board of Election. All lawyers who implement the law. There are two military high courts also, military Supreme Court and military administrative court. 
military supreme court of appeals obviously look into matters of crimes committed by the military personnel and military administrative court about is about administrative decisions about promotion or retirement or expulsion from the military and what have you and these issues eventually are appealed to these courts these are high level courts these courts have been instrumental in running the system by providing members to administrative body of the Supreme Board of Prosecutors and Judges who had been appointing judges to the courts of the country and also the prosecutors as well makes all sorts of investigations about them and of course there are lower level courts criminal courts um, courts of cassation administrative courts which people could directly appeal higher courts are the highest echelon of decision making in matters within their jurisdiction so the lower level courts decide about a case then if either side decide to appeal the, the verdict of the lower court these are the courts that will be looking into the matter now these have had several different practices of number of judges who serve on them application procedures and also appointments to these courts have changed over time in the 1982 constitution originally constitutional court members were appointed by the president now in more recent years after the 2010 referendum that practice is now shared by the Grand National Assembly and not only a matter of the presidential decree I'm not going to go into the vicissitudes of these appointment processes but they are not elected and Turkey does not have a jury system in which the people take part in the making of decisions about a criminal case yes Yes, in, in the appointment of the Constitutional Court, this just keeps changing from time to time. Uh, there had been more effort at bringing in the Grand National Assembly into the picture and making it more effective in um, appointing these judges. Although that step was not fully taken, still the President appoints a relatively large number of judges for long periods of tenure about 12 months about 12 years um, so the initial formulation had assumed that there would be a neutral president non-partisan and the appointments would be made on the basis of merit not partisanship in the recent years there had been a big row over the nature of the judges the conservative party in government argued that the judges were all secular and that they were constantly making arguments against the government 
which is nothing peculiar to Turkey. You hear similar arguments, for example, made by Berlusconi's party in Italy about the judges. Or even in the United States, you do hear conservative politicians who accuse the judges of being leftists and secularists and what have you. So it's nothing peculiar to them, but they have tried to change all of this by trying to insert as much influence through the appointment of judges by the intervention of the majority of the Grand National Assembly. Um, the basic arguments over these appointments are still continuing as to who would be more trusted, elected partisan president or elected partisan Grand National Assembly, or how are they supposed to be making these kinds of appointments. So we'll continue on hearing about this matter for a long time to come. The Prosecutor General plays a major role in the system, for he is in a position to sue a political party and appeal to the Constitutional Court for a party closure. And Prosecutor Generals had played that role in the past on many occasions. In fact, as late as 2007, 2008, there was a case against the government party, again appealed by the Prosecutor General at the Constitutional Court for its closure. Constitutional Court decided that this party has become a focal point of activities against secularism in Turkey did not decide so far as to go far enough and decide to ban the party and decided to punish it by levying a certain fine and stopped at that level. So Prosecutor General, of course, doesn't act alone. He has a big office with several prosecutors working for him. If I'm not mistaken, the total number is around 60. And they constantly went through um, the flow of information that are aired in the media and the press. And they do not need to take action by appeal to their office upon hearing about a certain question, a rumor, a gossip of some sort even, they can start an investigation and something may come out of it. They are also, uh, therefore, uh, effectively tied to, as the map indicates, or this chart indicates, to the Supreme Court of Appeals. And they are the prosecution within this court's operation, which of course takes up all the criminal cases. And the cases about Erganakon, Mbalios, and the others that I mentioned had gone all the way up to, to Yargitai. Um, more recently again, after 2010, changes had occurred in the status of the Constitutional Court, which could only be appealed in the past by political parties in the Grand National Assembly directly, and also by the president of the country, or by lower level courts who discover a constitutional issue which they cannot decide on their own, but refer this case to the Constitutional Court. Therefore, Constitutional Court is functionally focused on constitutionality of legislation of any sort, of all laws in Turkey. It's a specialized body. And this is more European in constitutional review, as opposed to the American practice, or Anglo-American practice, but more American practice, where the constitutionality of, of a matter may be taken up by any judge, and could then be appealed by the Supreme Court as any other matter of adjudication. So in that sense that Turkey also belongs to the European practice, where there is a specialized constitutional court that reviews the practice of the legislature and passes judgment on it 
and checks the constitutionality of these practices. However, more recently, the Constitutional Court is also entrusted with personal appeals of individuals whose civil liberties they complain as to have been breached by political or other administrative action. So individuals can also appeal if they believe that their human rights or civil liberties were violated. Therefore, Constitutional Court became the last court of appeal before anybody can appeal outside of the country to the European Court of Human Rights of the Council of Europe, of which Turkey is a member and accepts the jurisdiction of that court. So these appeals courts are not the last resort. They are one step below the last resort. The last resort is European Court of Human Rights. European Court of Human Rights can, of course, decide on some indemnity to be paid to those whose rights are breached. And if the government drags its feet, the other governments of Council of Europe can decide on ending its membership under these circumstances. Therefore, there is a penalty attached to it, if that be, which is, of course, um, a high sanction which states do not necessarily try to enjoy. As a result of that, the Turkish appeal system starts from the lower level courts whose verdicts can be appealed depending on whether they're an administrative nature, criminal nature, or constitutional nature uh, to these higher courts of appeals. And their verdict can then be appealed to the Court of Human Rights. And the decision of the Court of Human Rights in Europe will be the final decision and the final appeals mechanism that exists. Now, the working of the system, as I have already mentioned, has not necessarily produced a very successful result so far. Let me share some statistics with you. In 2011, or beginning of 2012, I'm sorry, the European Court of Human Rights published these statistics. You can find it in its own web page. It has 47 members. And since 1959, the court delivered 15,000 judgments. Near the half of the judgments concerned four member states, topping the list, Turkey, 2,747 decisions. Second, Italy, with 2,166. Third, Russia, with 1,212. Fourth, Poland, with 945. Of all the decisions that the European Court of Human Rights made, close to 19% were, were about Turkey. This is a dismal record, which shows that the rule of law is most problematic among these 47 countries that are members to the European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction or Council of Europe. Turkey's record was the worst in 2011, no longer. And we're thankful to Russia for that. Not because of anything that Turkey has done. For in the last couple of years, as you can see, the applications in which judgments delivered dropped from about 500 in 2010 to about 190 in 2013. 
applications declared inadmissible or struck out increased from about close to 1,000 to about 9,000. This is because Turkish Constitutional Court now is another stage in which appeals need to be made. And the European Court of right, Human Rights decided to monitor the situation and see how the European Court of Human Rights has argued that it will see how the Turkish Constitutional Court performs in this matter before accepting these appeals. So far, Constitutional Court is not acting very effectively or efficiently, but it's doing not an awful job. It is performing at a standard that is close to the European Court of Human Rights. So Turkish statistics have improved. Not because there are less applications, but because most of the applications go through the additional step of appeals handled by the Constitutional Court. If you look at the total number of um, applications that are still pending, um, their number is about 18,000. But the ranking of the countries now start with Russia, 22%, Turkey is second, 13%, Italy follows closely, 11%. Turkey and Italy are very close to each other because Turkish criminal code was originally imported from Italy in 1936. Then it was changed recently in, in the 21st century, again, with a lot of input from the Italian criminal code. And it's a relatively slow process. It takes relatively long for a criminal court case to come to the point of decision. Long time in decision making is considered as an unjust practice by the Court of Human Rights and by the principles that they, they, they adhere to. Therefore, justice will be served by efficient decision making. Quick. By quick, it doesn't mean one day, two days, but probably about six months. Instead, we have cases that's lingering on for about 30 years, which started in a martial court in the 80s and finished in 2010 or 11. Now, that is not acceptable by the standards of the European Court of Human Rights. This is the sort of situation Italy and Turkey finds itself in, and therefore there are many cases against them. Then Ukraine, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, United Kingdom, Poland, Republic of Moldova, and then the remaining 37 states follow. These, these are the sort of front runners, so to speak. And the Turkish practice does not seem to be boding well. Much of that practice was deeply influenced by the Turkish fight with the PKK. And that created a lot of breaches of human rights, torture, which has decreased um, in, in years. Now, there are hardly any torture cases left. But summary executions in the past, um, then inhuman treatment, different kinds of torture, etc. And that increased the number of cases in the Turkish case. And the courts were not very effective in dealing with them in Turkey, as a result of which this statistic uh, appeared. As of, um, this is the fourth day of the seventh month, I assume, of 2014, right? Total pending applications about Turkey is 10,451. Um, some of them will be handled by a single judge. This shows the process, and therefore the number of cases have decreased a little bit, but um, we're still not at the end of 2014, and therefore the record doesn't seem to indicate that there's a stellar drop in, in all of these cases, as you can see. Um, so far in 2014, 
this figure 914 as opposed to the earlier figures of 2012 and 2013 seem to show that there has been uh, a, a, a, a good portion of increase in um, the, the drop in the number of cases that is judged against Turkey in the European Court of Human Rights in recent years. That's a, that's a good development. Now, there's another measure taking into consideration what is shown down here, limited government powers, absence of corruption, order and security, fundamental rights, open government, effective regulation of enforcement, access to civil justice, effective criminal justice. On all these, measures are made in about 65 countries in a project called World Justice Project. And uh, these outcomes for Turkey and the world are shown um, for the year 2011. As you can see, for the world, this is the, the pinkish uh, line is the world average other than Turkey, all the other 64 countries. And this is the Turkish performance in comparison to that. It looks as if limited government powers, Turkey seems to be lagging far behind. Worst is in fundamental rights. As you can see, Turkey is way below the world average so far as rule of law is concerned. Uh, in access to civil justice, Turkey is doing better than the average of all other countries, but in all, all other la realms lagging behind, effective criminal justice, human rights, and limited government, Turkey seems to be far below the standards of these other 64 countries in the study. Freedom of the press, there, the statistics from Reporters Without Borders, or Rapporteur Sans Frontières, it, their center is in Paris, France. If you look at these indices between 2002 and 2014, um, they start from 2002, go to 2014. As you can see, uh, the um, percentile ranking of the country and the rank in the world both deteriorated after 2008. Closer to zero, the better. Turkey seems to be going away from zero. And the rank in the world has come very close to 160. If I'm not mistaken, the total number of countries is something like 168 in the entire data set. So it looks as if Turkey is not doing very well so far as freedom of the press is concerned. In the 2012 and 2013 reports of Rapporteur Sans Frontières, there is a section, the title of which reads as follows. Turkey, the largest prison for journalists in the world. Turkey has 42 journalists in prison because of writing their own opinions only. Second to Turkey comes China, which is not a democracy, with 35 journalists in prison because of that reason. So it looks as if this is an issue in which Turkish court system seem not to have done especially well. And the developments was improving until 2005 and started to level off until 2008, and then from then on, it got worse. And now it seems to be tapering off again. Hopefully, we, we will come down very fast if we can fix this problem. But you can now assume that in this country, there doesn't seem to be much freedom of the press under these circumstances. Now, Transparency International also publishes annual indices, Judicial Independence Index, 
How independent is the judicial branch from the other branches of the government, especially the executive branch of government? Turkey has a 3.3 out of 7, which is not a passing grade, as you may easily imagine. It's an F. You know, 3.5 would be a low D. Ranked 88 out of 142. Rule of law index, it's in the 58th percentile below the health of the world. All of those countries included in the ranking, about 140 of them. So it's more like 85th or 86th, whatever, in the score in 2010. In 2013, it improved a little bit, became 56 percentile, two percentiles, but still below the health. Freedom of the press index, similarly, 146 out of 179 countries. Awful performance. None of the countries immediately in front of Turkey, immediately after Turkey, are democracies or aspiring to be democracies. Now, in 2014, Turkey has dropped to 154th out of 180 countries. One more country is added on from 179. Turkey dropped further. We're not improving so far as freedom of expression is concerned. Voice and accountability index, well, we're in the upper half. As Turkey, 43% percentile, and slightly improved to 41 percentile. Um, this is in 2014, I think. Uh, there's a little mistake there. This, two, this the, the reddish color is 2014. Corruption perception index. Turkey was 54th out of 176. Now 53rd out of 177. Improved a little bit in 2013. Wait until 2014 before you pass the judgment. It doesn't look as if we have improved very much in the corruption scale. When in the International Social Survey Program's annual survey in January through March, we asked the people in Turkey on an 11-point scale, okay, zero meaning totally clean. Ten, totally dirty. How clean is Turkish politics, we said. What is the average score of the people in Turkey who responded, do you think? You don't know. You can't tell. You're sleeping. OK, good bet. Any others? OK. Another good bet. Any others? Five. OK. Five is already written there. I won't write it. You came close. The whole sample, on the average, said seven. Those who intended to vote for the Justice and Development Party candidates in the 30th of March 2014 election said six. Not that big a difference, as you can see. Just this much difference. And it looks as if. Um, in the eyes of the voters, this ranking seems to have deteriorated slightly. We'll see what the outcome is going to be for 2014. They have a bribe payers index, paying bribes. Turkey ranks 19th out of 28. One is Switzerland, if I'm not mistaken. They don't pay bribes there. Or so the people report. I don't know. This is all a matter of about you know, reporting. 
They don't go and actually look. They ask people, you know. 19 out of 28 countries with a score of 7.5 out of 10. Relatively high score. Control of Corruption Index 2012, again, 56 percentile. Uh, I don't think there's an, oh, there's a new one now. We have dropped in 2013, before the revelations of the 17th of uh, December, to the sixth, 62nd percentile. Now, all of these matters are reflected on the courts. And the courts should have a say on all these matters and should be able to manage all these matters. And the Turkish court system is not doing a good job of this, as far as I can tell. Then there is the overall democracy index, which measures electoral process and pluralism, functioning of government, political participation, culture, and civil liberties. On civil liberties, that's what I would like to share with you. The rest does not concern this hour. Turkey, by the way, is 88 on this ranking at the end of 2012. Uh, just to give you an idea, Bolivia is 85th, Bangladesh 84th, Ukraine 80th, and not consider the democracy. It's a hybrid regime. Neither a democracy nor an authoritarian regime. And its worst performance is civil liberties, 412 which is as bad as Egypt, as you can see on this listing. These two are the same, and this is as bad as Egypt. Egypt is 109th in the scale. So international comparisons seem to indicate that Turkey is not doing terribly well in managing conflict, corruption, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom of the media, freedom of associations, access to courts, and human rights performances. And the judiciary seems to be lagging behind so far as this is concerned, and Turkey urgently needs some kind of understanding to uproot the standards of its judicial system as quickly as possible, for these performances are a major impediment to any of the goals Turkey sees in its politics or economy. 